Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Humans Like Guns, written by Catfish21SM. Out of all the races in the galaxy, the humans could be said to be the most obsessed with guns. Most races build and develop guns for war. Some of the more predatory races will build them for sport to hunt large, exotic wildlife. Humans, on the other hand, just like to own them. They don't have to shoot them, though many probably would prefer to. But humans are satisfied with just owning guns. No one really complains about that. It's become pretty accepted at this point, and a very welcome addition to most ships. Humans are often hired as bodyguards when a death world exploration is required. Being from the highest rated death world known to sustain life, the humans are a valuable asset to any death world exploration team. And it's not uncommon that their guns do come in handy when dealing with extraordinary circumstances. It might be true that more than 90% of the time, humans can easily tear an alien predator in half with their bare hands. But no one ever wants to get close enough to an alien predator to test that theory. Furthermore, some alien predators are pack hunters, and while a human could probably easily fight off one or two at a time, a dozen is a different story. That's where their rapid-fire weapons come in truly handy. That being said, weapons are obviously regulated by the Galactic Union. That's very important to considering that humans have probably the best weapons in the galaxy. I mean, Considering their love for guns, it's no wonder that they have private investors willing to invest terror credits into the development and creation of new guns. There are generally five classifications of weapons, with the most powerful being for military use only. The other three are allowed for civilian use with the appropriate licensing, training, and obviously, observation. Having a gun on a ship can be a little nerve-wracking for some people, especially their first time and especially when that gun is in the hands of a Death World Apex Predator. However, we've had them to board several times, not the same ones usually, but different humans depending on the threat level of the Death World in question. Our crew actually specialized in Death World exploration and cataloging. At the fringes of explored space, when a new Death World is discovered, crews like ours will explore, document, catalog, and sample Death World and their fauna and fauna, we do jobs that self-driven drones are too delicate to do. There are only four crews in the galaxy that hold our speciality, and one of them is on an on-off basis. Our tasks typically take several years, so our contracts are very long-lasting. But our findings can revolutionize various fields of study, from genetics to medicine. So, we are absolutely necessary. Each newly discovered death world is first probed with automatic drones gathering complex information about hazards, including mapping and weather information, along with flora and fauna samples of their own used for testing. Then the death world is given a classification, a threat level, and a price. By price, I mean the price for exploration. The species who owns the death world will usually want a crew like ours to go in and gather as much specialized information as possible. So, the world is given a price, a sort of bounty, so to say, based on how quickly they want the information. Then crews like ours will review that information and decide which world to go to after the next. Our job is obviously very lucrative, so you might expect others to try and join us so that there are no death worlds left to explore, right? Not quite. The reason there are only four crews that do this job is because others tend to fail very quickly. Insurance is not a thing in our line of work for obvious reasons. The first crew to ever take on this task was actually 100% human. But humans have very short lifespans of only about 200 years. And the amount of time that they can operate efficiently is even shorter. So, the humans began hiring other species for certain specialized tasks as their older members began dying off. Over time, these crews eventually split into four, with one still being a primarily human. There are certain worlds that only that crew is willing to take on. They are the Tem crew that I mentioned earlier. When the humans are not on the job, they will sell their services to other crews. This works out for everyone very well. Humans tend to be paid much better than the other members of the crew 
all their absolutely crucial tasks. So instead of taking on cheaper worlds and having to evenly split the rewards between them all, they instead go to individually or in small groups to lower value death worlds and still earn roughly the same. Well, it's probably less than they might have for a high value death world, but it's still more than they would be exploring on their own. Our human for the specific mission was John. He was fairly new, only 20 years of age, so probably the first time he'd ever been on a death world exploration. He was recommended to us by the captain of the human crew. For him, this was probably the training mission and introduction before he started taking on harder jobs with the other humans. We still had full confidence in him. He was recommended by the human captain after all, and being human was a qualification in and of itself. Plus, it wasn't like that we were going to go to a level 5 death world or anything. This one was a cheaper gig. It wouldn't last very long, only about 4 years, and just included basic job tasks. This mission could be said to have been a short break for the rest of the crew. We would still be working so that we didn't get rusty, and it would still be paid. But for a crew of our experience level, a Category 3 death world with a Level 4 threat level was more of a vacation. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Any normal person would call us insane for ever comparing a death world exploration mission to a vacation. That's basically just how we saw it. A death world is still a death world, however, and John being new wasn't in and of itself all that reassuring. However, his armament helped to fill us with a bit more confidence. He came with his own customized weapons. He was what the humans usually called a gun freak. A special case amongst the humans who had an above average obsession with guns, even for their species. He had four weapons, two long range rifles, a mid range rapid fire rifle, a short range beam pistol that was rated for rapid fire. Basically, his weapons could easily make up for his lack of experience, and considering that his species came from a category 9 threat level 12 death world where death to environmental factors was commonplace, his natural instincts should be far more than we would ever need. For this little mission. The mission itself went rather smoothly. We had no worries after all. The world wasn't classified as having any predatory species so the guns were never even needed. But you could never fully trust the drone data 100%. The human did save us from a catastrophe once when they simply said under their breath with a completely nonchalant expression, looks like rain. Most of the crew missed that but a few more experienced members picked up on it. When it's common knowledge where when a human says looks like rain, they don't typically mean a light shower. They usually mean a threat level 4 or greater storm. With his inexperience, he probably didn't know that such a storm could be life-threatening to us, so he probably didn't think anything of it. It might sound crazy, but I've literally seen small groups of humans play game, and I mean literally have fun playing games in a threat level 6 storm. They were actually enjoying it. They called the activity playing in the rain. I stopped telling people the story because no one would believe it unless they witnessed something similar firsthand. Other members of some of the other crews like to share our stories about humans like these. So suffice to say, when the experienced member of our crew heard this from a human, they declared an immediate evacuation. The human was quite surprised and couldn't seem to wrap his head around us evacuating for a rainstorm. This led a few of our other newer members to feel exasperated, thinking that they were blowing the whole thing out of the water. However, when they watched the storm from the shuttle blow in with more than 15 miles per hour wind, occasionally gusting up to 30 miles per hour, and the human just peacefully sleeping, they then understood why everyone panicked. The next morning, several of them aggravated by the human's reaction asked why, or better yet, how he was sleeping through that. He just nonchalant explained that the sound of rain and thunder helps him sleep better. The crew did not know how to respond. The mere thought of thunder and lightning, which looked and sounded like they could be weapons of mass destruction, actually aided the human in sleep. This thought terrified them to their bones or their race's equivalent expression. Many of the older and more experienced members of the crew just silently smeared as the newer members learned the real value of having a human on board. That being said, when the commotion finally calmed down, I did feel my responsibility to have a conversation with the human about their nonchalant reaction to all of this. It wasn't their fault. Hailing from a level 12 death world probably meant that storms at least this strong, if not worse, were probably a normal occurrence to the human. 
Even so, the human needed to know that this nonchalant attitude could potentially cost the lives of other crew members. I didn't make it out to be that big of a deal. They were coming with us to learn the ropes after all. But I did make it clear that they should be more verbal about environmental hazards that they notice, even if they do not seem all that threatening to him. After seeing how shook up everyone was, he apparently came to the same conclusion beforehand, so the talk probably wasn't even that necessary. But even so, it helped me to get to know him a little better. Thankfully, he did not have any other major occurrences happen on the world like that. The human asked us on multiple occasions for permission to test fire their weapons. We denied them the opportunity. According to galactic law, while guns could not be used on any inhabited world, technically, a death world at the fringe of society should be okay. But it might scare even some of the older members of our crew, so we denied him. He didn't seem happy about that. He didn't even seem bothered either. The thing about the weapons law is if you are on a crew, even if you are in an uninhabited system, you must have permission from both the captain and the majority of the crew to use said weapon, with the exception of obvious emergency events. The human was extremely happy about his new top-of-the-line customized long-range anti-matter rifle. I didn't know much about what that type of weapon, but it sounded quite powerful. So even the thought of it being shot honestly kind of terrified me even. The main event of our story happens about 14 months into exploration, however. During a routine resupply trip, we were ambushed by pirates. We did not have enough weapons aboard to fend them off. I mean, the ship was absolutely massive. It was a carrier-class vessel with several smaller vessels surrounding it, all of them at least the size of our exploration ship and armed to the teeth. We hoped that if we just gave our first ship, they would let us escape on one of our research shuttles with most of the data that we had collected thus far. So we opened up communications in order to discuss complete surrender. They didn't seem to like the idea of losing a valuable research shuttle and offered to throw us into empty airtight storage containers and shoot us off. Obviously, we weren't coming to a reasonable agreement, but we continued negotiating the best that we could. That's when our alarm went off to alert us that our airlock had just opened. Oh no. They were using a conversation to distract us while they boarded. We were doomed. Immediately I threw the entire ship into emergency lockdown, closed all the airtight hatches, and tried to buy as much time as I could. I sent out a request for information from anyone close to the hatches on the number of invaders and their level of armaments. The human responded, Sorry sir, it's just me. No invaders yet. What are you doing leaving the ship? You know you can't run into open space without nothing but a spacesuit, don't you? Get back in the ship this instant. We're negotiating a peaceful surrender. Sorry, sir. No can do. And why is that, John? Well, sir, this is an emergency situation. They're all criminals, and I might never get a better opportunity to test out my new rifle on some live targets again. What is one little gun going to do against that? Do you see the size of that ship? There are probably 20 or more ships the size of ours docked in that thing's hell bay. Get back here right now before you make them angry at us and ruin our negotiations. No can do, sir. Just sit back and watch my baby work. I closed my eyes tight as I could, praying to the galactic core that by some miracle his gun might, by some miracle, hit the captain and throw them off guard long enough for us to escape into hyperspace. Several seconds passed and nothing happened. Communications went silent and when I opened my eyes the enemy carrier was... Uh, gone. I shouted in surprise to the rest of the crew. W what happened? One of the other crew members responded, Uh, it just disappeared, sir. Disappeared? Where? How? If that thing had entered hyperspace this close to us, then we would be blown to smithereens. What happened? Be clear. Well, uh, it just kind of imploded, sir. Then over my comms, I heard the human's voice. Woohoo! Yeah, baby! That was a nice shot. I responded. John, what was that? Was all of that you're doing? Yes, sir. Uh, pretty cool, huh? I thought you said you had an antimatter rifle. That should create an explosion, not an implosion. How did you do that? Uh, oh, sorry for the misunderstanding, boss. Antimatter is the brand name of the rifle. It's actually a grav ripple gun. It's a little too complex to explain. So to simplify, the gun creates a gravitational ripple in a specified location in space, resulting in the effect similar to that of a temporary black hole. Uh, the enemy ship is still there. It's just being crushed into about the size of an atom. 
It'll probably decay back into energy over the next few hundred years. That is absolutely ridiculous. Do you expect me to believe that your little gun can single-handedly destroy a ship that size with a single shot? Well, actually, sir, it can destroy a small moon on its highest setting. Highest setting? John, what is the purpose on that gun? Uh, mostly it's used to clear asteroid belts and stuff, uh, to make way for new spaceports after all the useful materials has been mined out. How many shots can that thing fire? Um, about, about a dozen in quick succession. Uh, that's the maximum legal limit. Can you take out those other ships for us? Already done, boss, uh, did it while we were talking. As I looked around, I saw the widened focal organs of my other crew as they all enemies had systematically imploded, one at a time in quick succession. Don't worry, he's on our side, I shouted to reassure them all. So how did you even get such a device? Don't get me wrong, I'm glad you have it, but you're only rated for a Category 3 weapon. Uh, this is a Category 3 weapon, sir. Wait. I don't believe you. That would mean that the human military has more powerful weapons than this. Uh, yeah. The classification 5CRX9001 is nicknamed the Star Destroyer. What I wouldn't give to get my hands in that beauty. I sighed as the thoughts crossed my head, and I chose to ignore everything that he was saying from this point on. Re-entering ship, sir. Can you please open the hatches for me? Sure, sure. At that point, I whispered to myself, Now I know the reason for the Galactic Union Law 1. I feel sorry for anyone stupid enough to mess with the humans. End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Bushmaster177, Lord Azrakal, Ambrose Cattell, Quantum Wednesday, Drugzoon, WRE, and Blueberry Cat. Thank you very much for the support. It is super appreciated.